We are going to be wrapping up today with a somewhat higher level perspective. We're not going to get into the minutia of 0.3375% of the sales tax goes to, I love that stuff. That's my kind of stuff. We're going to a little arid, slightly different area today with so many of the issues we've been discussing today. Our keynote speaker is Professor Michael uh, Sandel, and he teaches political philosophy at Harvard, where he is the Ann T. and Robert M. Bass Professor of Government. His work covers some very big areas, justice, ethics, democracy, and markets. His course, entitled Justice, is the first at Harvard to be made freely available online and on television. It has been viewed by tens of millions of people around the world, and his writings have been translated into 27 languages. Perhaps most impressive of all is something that I just found out five minutes ago. Professor Sandel, when he would correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, when he was 18 years old, challenged the then governor of California, Ronald Reagan, to a debate. And I'm going to leave it to Professor Sandel to tell us who won that debate, because I haven't had time to see the footage of it since I learned this five minutes ago. But he, uh, the governor showed up, and they debated the war. Yes, OK. So we're gonna, we're, we'll, hear, we'll hear a little more. Maybe, I don't know if we'll, how much we'll hear about that, but it is really a huge honor. As I said, it's uh, tens of millions of people translated into 27 languages. His books relate enduring themes of political philosophy to the most vexing moral and civil questions of our time, civic questions of our time. They include what money can't buy, the moral limits of markets, justice, what's the right thing to do, the case against perfection, ethics in the age of genetic engineering, public philosophy, essays on morality and politics, democracy's discontent, America in search of a public philosophy, and liberalism and the limits of justice. Additionally, I think the most recent one is the tyranny of merit. Can we find the common good? That's the most recent, correct? Yes. Uh, Michael has been a visiting professor at the Sorbonne and delivered the Tanner Lectures on Human Values at Oxford, the BBC's Reith Lectures, and the Kellogg Lecture on Jurisprudence at the US Library of Congress. Much like we do here at CEPR, Michael has really expanded the reach of his research and expertise far beyond the ivory tower. He has engaged with governments and the media in the US and around the world. And I could easily expend our entire remaining allotted time sharing with you more about his accomplishments and his credentials. But I know that, you, that he would prefer that we take the time, and you would too, for him to present and take your questions. So the game plan for this session is that Professor Sandel will speak for about 25 or so minutes. He and I will then have a conversation where I'll, where I'll ask him a few questions, and then I'll open it up for questions from all of you, uh, and I may intersperse your questions with my own to make things even more interesting. So it is really a tremendous honor to be joined with Professor Michael Sandel. Please join me in welcoming him to CEPR. Thank you, Mark for that warm introduction and welcome to CEPR. Mm -hmm. And thank you all for coming for a discussion that's going to be a little bit different from the previous discussions you've had on taxation. I'd like to begin with a simple question. What is taxation for? Now, the answer may seem so obvious that it's almost not even worth asking the question. The obvious answer is to raise revenue so that government can perform its functions. Now, of course, people disagree about the proper functions of government. And many of our debates about tax policy are debates about the proper role of government. But our debates about tax policy even where we may agree on certain legitimate needs and functions of government, tend to revolve around two familiar considerations. Considerations of efficiency and of fairness. Efficiency considerations draw on an underlying utilitarian idea that the purpose of an economy is to maximize consumer welfare. Ideas about fairness point to a different principle, princi principle of distributive justice. And each of these two considerations that arise whenever we debate 
tax policy, point to broader questions of economic policy. How should we, how can we increase the size of the pie? How can we maximize consumer welfare? And how should we distribute the pieces of the pie? Question of distributive justice. These are the familiar poles, the terms of argument when we argue about tax and for that matter about economic policy in general. What I would like to suggest to you today, and we'll see what you think and Mark will test me and challenge me on this idea, is that these familiar considerations, these two, are not the only ones that matter. In addition to questions of efficiency and fairness, underlying our debates about tax and about economic policy are competing conceptions about how we honor and reward the different contributions that people make to the economy, and for that matter, to the common good. My claim is this. Underlying our debates about tax policy and economic policy are two fundamental questions of moral and political philosophy. First, who deserves what and why? And second, what counts as a valuable contribution to the common good? Now, to tie these two questions more tightly to our familiar economic debates, they often take the following form. First, does the free market, at least under conditions of equal opportunity, does the free market give people what they deserve? And second, is the money people make in a free market a true measure, an accurate measure, of the value of their contributions? Now, you might be tempted to think that those who answer no to those two questions, does the market give people what they deserve, and is money, is the money people make the measure of their, the value of their contribution? You might say that people who answer no to these questions are liberals, and people who answer yes are free market conservatives. That would be, at first glance, a fairly intuitive possibility. What's interesting is that Free market conservatives, in very good standing, disagree about the answers to these two questions. For example, and let me begin with a free market conservative, a colleague of mine, who answers yes to both questions. The free market does give people what they deserve, assuming it's against a background of equal opportunity, and the money people make is the measure of the value of their contribution. Greg Mankiw, who served as an economic advisor to President George W. Bush, makes this argument. He argues people should get what they deserve. A person who contributes more to society deserves a higher income that reflects those greater contributions. He gives examples. Steve Jobs, J.K. Rowling, most people agree, Mankiw argues, that they deserve the millions they make because their high earnings reflect the great value to society of iPhones and riveting adventure tales. And Mankiw extends this reasoning to all incomes in a competitive market economy. Morality should endorse the results that competitive markets generate, he argues, for care workers and hedge fund managers alike, since each person's income reflects the value of what he or she contributed to society's production of goods and services, Mankiw argues, one might easily conclude that each person receives his or her just desserts. Now, so Mankiw's view, the one I've just read out, answers yes to both questions. 
But it's interesting that there is another free market conservative of pretty significant standing and impact who disagrees, who answers no to the first question, but yes to the second, Friedrich Hayek. Hayek rejects the notion that a free market gives people what they deserve. He rejects it on the ground that what people earn depends on native abilities and talents that are no doing of the person endowed with them. It also depends on the vagaries of supply and demand, whether the talents I have to offer are rare or plentiful will certainly influence how much money I make. But that's no doing of mine. It's no doing of mine, and yet it's decisive for income in the market. So on these grounds, Hayek rejects the idea that the free market gives people what they deserve. What it does give people, Hayek argues, is the measure of the value they contribute. So the second question, he answers, yes. But there is a third free market conservative economist of enormous distinction and influence who actually answered no to both questions. Frank Knight was one of the founders of neoclassical economics. He was a critic of the New Deal. He taught at the University of Chicago. Some would describe him as the grandfather of the Chicago School of Economics. His students included Milton Friedman and others who would become leading libertarian economists. And Frank Knight, nonetheless, took aim at the idea that markets reward merit. Here's what he said. It's a common assumption that productive contribution is an ethical measure of desert. But an examination of the question will readily show that productive contribution can have little or no ethical significance. He offers two arguments against attributing moral desert to market outcomes. One is the argument about talents, taken up by Hayek, who was influenced by him. Having the talents that enable me to cater to market demand is no more my doing than inheriting valuable property. It's hard to see, Knight wrote, that possession of the capacity to furnish services which are in demand constitutes an ethical claim to a superior share of the social dividend. Moreover, the income my talents command depends on how many other people also possess them. But that also isn't my doing. That circumstance, that's my good luck if my talents happen to be rare and distinctive. It's hard to see how it's more meritorious, he writes, merely to be different from other people in my talents than it is to be like them. So this is how he gives in the answer no to the first question about merit and desert. But he also answers no even to the second question about value, about whether the market is a measure of the value of my contribution. And he rejects this idea arguing that meeting market demand is not necessarily the same thing as making a truly valuable contribution to society. Why? Because serving market demand is simply a matter of satisfying whatever wants and desires people happen to have. But the ethical significance of satisfying this or that want depends on the moral worth of those wants and preferences. Evaluating the worth of people's wants and preferences involves moral judgments, admittedly contestable, that economic analysis can't provide. So even setting aside the question of talents, it's a mistake to assume that the money people make by catering to consumer preferences reflects merit or moral desert. You can see the plausibility 
of Knight's position by considering an example. Did you see the, that, the series Breaking Bad? Did lo, a lot of you probably familiar with it. Now, you remember that, that uh, Walter White has two careers. One much more lucrative than the other. <laughs> he starts out as a high school chemistry teacher, teaching to indifferent students, rather indifferent, distracted students. And he doesn't make much money doing that. In fact, you remember, he had to work in a car wash to make ends meet in a, when he was a high school chemistry teacher. But then he later comes to employ his expertise as a chemist to make a very high quality of pure meth. And it's so pure that it commands millions on the drug market. And the income he reaps far exceeds his modest pay as a teacher. And yet most would agree, I suspect everyone in this room would agree, that his contribution as a teacher, though far less remunerative, has far greater value than his contributions as a drug dealer. And this has nothing to do with market imperfections or the fact that laws banning drugs limit the supply and so boost the profits of people who peddle them illegally. Because even if meth were legal, a talented chemist might still make more money producing meth than teaching students. But it doesn't follow that the meth dealer's contribution is really more valuable than the teacher's. Or consider someone engaged in a legal enterprise if you're worried about the, uh, about the constrained market. Consider the billionaire casino mogul. He recently passed away, Sheldon Adelson, one of the richest men in the world, made thousands of times more than a nurse or a doctor. But even assuming that markets for casino moguls and healthcare providers are perfectly competitive, there's no reason to believe that their market value reflects the true value of their contributions to society. Why? Well, because the value of their contributions depends on the moral importance of the ends they serve not on how effectively they satisfy consumer demand. Caring for people's health is just morally more important, I think most of us would agree, morally more important than catering to people's desire to play slot machines. That's not so important. So this is Knight's argument. He, this is why he answers no to both of those questions. Uh, though he was, he's very much in favor of the free market and he was against uh, New Deal regulations and so on, he did not think either that the free market gives people what they deserve or that it defines the value of their contributions. Now, how does this bear on where we find ourselves today with our economic debates, and also with our deeply polarized public life. I'd like to illustrate the way these two big questions about who deserves what and about what counts as a valuable contribution, the way these two questions are implicit in debates these days, debates that bear on taxation, by looking at our broader public life, and in particular, at the grievances and anxieties about work and about the dignity of work that loom quite large in the politics of our day. And for this, we need to look back over the last four decades. For decades, the divide between winners and losers in our society has been deepening, poisoning our politics, setting us apart. This has partly to do with the widening inequalities of income and wealth during the age of globalization. But it's not only that. It has also to do, this divide, I think, with the changing attitudes towards success that have accompanied the widening inequality. 
those who've landed on top have come to believe that their success, our success, is our own doing, the measure of our merit, and that we therefore deserve the full measure of the bounty that the market bestows upon us. And by implication, that those who struggle, those left behind, have no one to blame but themselves. This way of thinking about success arises from a seemingly attractive principle, the principle of meritocracy. The principle that says, if chances are equal, the winners deserve their winnings. This is the heart of the meritocratic ideal. Now, in practice, of, short, uh, of course, we fall short. We don't live up to the meritocratic principles we profess. Here's one small but telling example. Despite generous financial aid policies at Ivy League universities, including at Stanford and at Harvard, there are today more students from, the top, from families in the top 1% than there are from families in the entire bottom half of the income scale combined. But the problem isn't only that we fail to live up to the meritocratic ideal. The ideal itself is flawed. And the flaw has to do with the attitudes towards success, the harsh attitudes towards success, that even a perfect, a perfectly realized meritocracy cultivates. It leads to hubris among the winners and to humiliation for those who lose out. It encourages the successful, here's another way of putting it, to inhale too deeply of their success, to forget the luck and good fortune that helped them on their way. And it leads them to look down on those less fortunate than themselves. This matters for politics. Because one of the most potent sources of the populist backlash against elites is the sense among many working people that elites look down on them, especially credentialed elites. This, it seems to me, is a legitimate complaint. Because even as globalization brought widening inequality and stagnant wages, its proponents offered workers some bracing advice. If you want to compete and win in the global economy, go to university. What you earn will depend on what you learn. That was Bill Clinton's favorite slogan. You can make it if you try. These elites failed to see the insult implicit in this advice. The insult was this. If you didn't go to college, and if you're not flourishing in the new economy, you have yourself to blame. So it's no wonder that many working people turned against meritocratic elites. So what should we do? One of the things we need to do is to focus less on arming people for meritocratic competition and focus more on making life better for those who may lack a diploma but who nonetheless make essential contributions to our society through the work they do, the families they raise, and the communities they serve. This means renewing the dignity of work and putting it at the center of our politics. We need to remember that work is not only about making a living. It's also about contributing to the common good and winning recognition and social esteem for doing so. Robert F. Kennedy, he was one of my political heroes. He put it well half a century ago. He said, fellowship, community, shared patriotism, these essential values do not come from just buying and consuming goods together. They come instead from dignified employment at decent pay, the kind of employment that enables us to say, 
I helped to build this country. I am a participant in its great public ventures. This civic sentiment is largely absent from public life today. Now, it's easy to slide into the assumption that the money people make is the measure of their contribution to the common good. But this is a mistake. We've seen how no less a free market conservative than Frank Knight said so. More recently, Martin Luther King explained why. Shortly before he was assassinated, Dr. King spoke to a group of striking sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee. And he said this, he said, the person who picks up our garbage is, in the final analysis, as significant as the physician. Because if he doesn't do his job, diseases are rampant. And then he added, all labor has dignity. Now, why is it, how is it, that our politics has lost sight of this? Well, one of the ways it's lost sight of it is that in recent decades, our economic policies and our politics have focused on our identity as consumers more than on our identity as producers. This matters because consumer and producer identities, of course, most of us are both. But uh, consumer and producer identities point to two different ways of understanding the common good. The consumerist conception of our identity, or for that matter, of our citizenship, defines the common good as simply the sum of everyone's preferences and interests. This is the utilitarian idea. We achieve the common good by maximizing consumer welfare, typically by maximizing GDP. If the common good is simply a matter of satisfying consumer preferences, then market wages are a good measure of who has contributed what. Those who've made the most money have presumably made the most valuable contributions to the common good by producing the goods and services that consumers want. This was Mancu's assumption. But there is a second conception of the common good that rejects this, that rejects the consumerist idea of the common good in favor of what might be called, by contrast, the civic conception of the common good. According to the civic ideal, the common good isn't just about adding up preferences or maximizing consumer welfare. It's about reflecting critically on our preferences, ideally elevating and improving them so that we can live worthwhile and flourishing lives. And this kind of deliberation can't be achieved through economic activity alone. It requires deliberating with our fellow citizens about how to bring about a, a good society, one that cultivates civic virtue, and that enables us to reason together about the purposes worthy of our political community. That's the civic or the deliberative conception of the common good. It doesn't take preferences as given, as fixed, and simply a matter of how to maximize their satisfaction. What does this have to do with work and the dignity of work? The civic conception of the common good suggests a certain way of thinking about work. Because from the standpoint of the civic conception, the most important role we play in the economy is not as consumers, but rather as producers. Because it's as producers that we develop and exercise our abilities to provide goods and services that fulfill the needs of our fellow citizens. And it's as producers, not consumers, that we can win social recognition and esteem. The true value of our contribution can't be measured 
from this point of view by the wage we receive because wages depend, as Frank Knight pointed out, on contingencies of supply and demand. The value of our contribution on the civic conception depends instead on the moral and the civic importance of the ends our efforts serve. And this requires an independent moral judgment that the labor market, however efficient, can't provide. So, what would it mean to shift in our public discourse and in our way of thinking about economic policy to, to an understanding of our identity as producers that takes seriously the bid to accord dignity to work? Uh, to, to work and to the work people do and to the contributions they make. And what would this have to do with tax? Well, let me give you one example. And it has to do with the growing role of finance. Back in 1984, as financialization was beginning to take off, as finance was beginning to claim a larger and larger share of the economy and of corporate profits, James Tobin, the Yale economist, offered a prescient warning of what he called the casino aspect of our financial markets. He worried, quote, that we are throwing more and more of our resources, including the cream of our youth, into financial activities remote from the production of goods and services into activities that generate high private rewards disproportionate, he said, to their social productivity. This was Tobin. Now, it's hard to know exactly what portion of financial activity improves the productive capacity of the real economy and what portion of it generates unproductive windfalls for the financial industry itself. But Adair Turner, who was the head of the uh, financial authority in Britain after the financial crisis, has, uh, Adair Turner has estimated that in advanced economies, such as the US and the UK, only 15% of financial flows go into new productive enterprises rather than into speculation on already existing assets or fancy derivatives. Now, I don't know if that estimate is right, but even if it underestimates by half the productive aspect of finance, it's a sobering finding. And its implications are not only economic, they're also moral and political. Economically, it suggests that much financial activity actually hinders rather than promotes economic growth. Morally and politically, it reveals a vast discrepancy between the rewards the market bestows on finance and the value of its contribution to the common good. This discrepancy, along with the disproportionate prestige accorded those engaged in speculative pursuits mocks the dignity of those who earn a living producing useful goods and services in the real economy. Now, Tobin himself was suggesting the use of the tax system to reconfigure the economy of esteem in the domain of finance by discouraging speculation and honoring productive labor. And this, this gave rise to his proposal for a Tobin tax, a tax on speculative financial transactions. And generally speaking, if you were worried about this gap between what the economy rewards and what truly counts as a valuable contribution to the productive economy. 
If you cared about that, then that would give rise to the question, should we shift the tax burden from work to consumption and speculation? Now, a radical way of doing so would be to lower or even eliminate the personal income tax and payroll taxes and to raise revenue instead by taxing consumption and wealth and financial transactions. A more modest step in this direction would be to reduce the payroll tax, which makes work expensive for employers and employees alike, and to make up the lost revenue with a financial transactions tax on, say, high-frequency trading, which arguably contributes little to the real economy. Now, these and other measures to shift the burden of taxation from labor to consumption and speculation could be done in ways that would make the tax system more efficient and less regressive than it is today. That's back to the debate about efficiency and fairness. But that's not the only thing at stake in a debate, or that might be at stake in a debate, about such a proposal. We should also consider, such a debate should also consider, what we might call the expressive significance of taxation. That's different from efficiency. It's different from fairness. The expressive significance of taxation. By this I mean the attitudes towards success and failure, honor and recognition, embedded in the way we fund our public life. The general point is this. Taxation is not only a way of raising revenue. It is also a way of expressing a society's judgment about what counts as a valuable contribution to the common good. Now, people may well disagree with the valuation of the contribution represented by financial speculation. And some argue that taxing uh, uh, finance and investment less heavily than work has desirable effects, that it encourages investment and so promotes economic growth. What's interesting is that even this argument, though it seems to be a purely practical utilitarian efficiency argument, also often carries an expressive conviction, namely that a certain idea of merit and deservingness lurks just below the surface of this argument. This is the assumption that those who engage in finance are job creators who should be rewarded with lower taxes. So an argument about deservingness and about what really counts as a valuable contribution underlies the position not only of someone like Tobin, but also possibly someone who disagrees with Tobin and wants to make the case for the value uh, and the merit associated with finance. Now, my purpose here is not to adjudicate that debate. It's simply to point out that these two questions about who deserves what and what counts as a valuable contribution to the economy underlie the debates we have about tax policy and about economic policy in general, even though they often lurk beneath the surface rather than figure explicitly in political argument. My broader point is that renewing the dignity of work, if that's an important response to the sense of grievances that have produced the angry, rancorous politics of our day, renewing the dignity of work requires that we contend with the moral questions underlying our economic arrangements, questions that we have neglected, that have been obscured in recent decades. Over the past four decades, finance-driven globalization and the meritocratic conception of success 
taken together, have been corrosive of the dignity of work, have unraveled the moral and civic ties that give us a sense of common identity and shared citizenship. Global supply chains, capital flows, and the cosmopolitan identities they fostered over the past four decades made many of us less reliant on our fellow citizens, less grateful for the work they do, and perhaps less open, therefore, to the claims of solidarity and mutual responsibility. Meritocratic attitudes towards success taught us that our success is our own doing. And so it eroded our sense of indebtedness and mutual obligation. We are now in the midst of the angry whirlwind this unraveling has produced. To renew the dignity of work, we need to address more explicitly the moral assumptions underlying our economic arrangements. And we need to repair the social and civic bonds that these last four decades have undone. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Professor Sandel. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> a lot of directions I can go here. So there was a lot there. So I, I will say, just hearing you made me reflect something. So in 2009 and 2010, I, um, I worked on uh, President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. And I, I'm a health economist, so I worked primarily on something that would later be called the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. Worked tirelessly on that. And I was a cog in a machine. I wasn't the pivotal person necessarily. But um, you know, it passed. And it was sort of baffled me after it happened why it had not, um, why there had not been more of a, why it had not been more politically profitable yeah. Yeah. for the president. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it was because it literally was raising taxes on high income people and expanding health insurance right. for low income people. But the sort of what you just described helps um, make sense of that, right? So I, I don't know what you're, yeah. uh, but there's, you know, people will often comment that many people who vote, let's say, for Donald Trump, yeah. the economic policies that he, or for that, like you know, others, or Boris Johnson, or what have you, right. don't necessarily align with their economic interests. So, a, as economists, we often wonder, like, how can that be? So, I don't know what, if you have thoughts that you'd like to share on this. I think, Mark, you've put it exactly right. This, um, the the interpretation uh, the, or the diagnosis that I proposed, if it's plausible, would provide one answer to that question. That. Uh, Democrats uh, like President Obama and the administration in which you served were and have been baffled by why would working people go twice for a candidate who wanted to get rid of Obamacare, even though many of those voters would have lost their health care. Right. It's because there were bigger stakes. And there were grievances to do with feeling looked down upon that overpower any calculation of costs and benefits about health care or family leave and uh, redistributive policies, even. It's a sense of if, if people feel that the work they do is not appreciated and honored and recognized, they feel that they have been rendered obsolete or invisible. They feel looked down upon. 
And that's a more potent animating political sentiment than any cost-benefit analysis about the cost of health care could possibly compete with. Right. So somewhat relatedly, um, one of the most, and we talked a few minutes ago about this before your remarks, one of the most common occupations in America is uh, home health aid. Yeah. Um, so I was looking at the numbers for the most recent data for 2021. In 2021, there were 3.46 million home health aides in the U.S. economy. That exceeds, if you were to aggregate up the alumni of Harvard, Stanford, the rest of the Ivies, and my alma mater, MIT, there are more home health aides than there are alums of all those institutions combined. Um, and their average hourly rate wage is $14 an hour. Um, so it, you know, it just it, it is uh, that's a hard job, yeah. um, and that is meaningful work. But I don't know if you have a comment on yeah, that. yeah. It is well first to agree, Mark, and I would just add this: those of us who spend our days in the company of the well-credentialed can easily forget a simple fact, which is that most of our fellow citizens don't have a four-year college degree. More than 60% of Americans do not. So it's folly to create an economy that sets as a necessary condition of dignified work and a decent life a four-year degree that most people don't have. And telling people that the solution to wage stagnation and inequality is to go improve yourself begins to feel, I think, to a great many working people, and rightly so, as a way of deflecting responsibility from the economic policies that elites of both parties uh, brought about over the past four decades and saying, it's not our fault for the econ economic arrangements that led to this condition. It's your fault because you didn't do what we told you to do, which is to improve yourself so you could compete. So you have written many words, uh, books, and other writings. And one thing that you talk about is the role of your employer and my employer and others like our two employers in this whole thing. So can you comment a little bit on how yes. our employers contribute to this <laughs> or, 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 or push back against it? Well, I would say our institutions rather than our employers. But yes, sure. but that's what you mean. Uh, we have, uh, well, enormous prestige and social and political and economic importance have flowed to institutions like ours over the past four decades, especially. Because higher education has been cast as the gatekeeper for the rewards that a market-driven meritocracy bestows. Our institutions define the merit and dispense the credentials that are rewarded in this system. And that's made us, made our institutions central and important, and one might even argue wealthy. But I'm not sure it's good for our society that we convert higher education into a kind of sorting machine. I worry that it's not even good for us, who seem to be the beneficiaries. I worry that higher education, when it becomes conscripted into the role of sorting machine, becomes so preoccupied with credentializing and networking, and that this is what we convey to our students, that our credentialing, networking, sorting function begins to crowd out our educational mission. And the, the pressure, think about the high pressure, anxiety-strewn gauntlet that young people, 
high school students have to endure to compete to get into these places, by the time they arrive, the winners, I mean, right now here we're talking about the winners, I think have been injured by this stress-strewn meritocratic gauntlet, habituated to a kind of hoop jumping and networking and seeking after credentials that distracts them from doing what undergraduates should do, which is to explore and reflect and to figure out what's worth caring about and why. And I think it's, it's our mission to keep open that space for young people, that space for reflection and critical examination. And I think when the sorting and the networking and the credentializing loom so large, they risk distracting our students from having the luxury that a liberal arts education should provide, which is to reflect. Great. Do you think I'm, I'm overly worried about that, or do you glimpse that as well, Mark? I think that it is, I think the whole system is incredibly costly to mm -hmm. people. The, I mean, the pre, the race, it's a rat race. Yeah. And, and there, there is work in economics about how the sort of rat race equilibrium can be bad for everyone, yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And it is, um, but it's hard. I mean, I guess my next question is, yeah. What what do you do about it? Right. <laughs> I mean, so it, there's there are the incumbents who even if you know if you talk with I remember when I used to talk with physicians about doing like 36 hour shifts and them agreeing that it probably wasn't in the patient's best interest, but the fact that they had to endure it, right. they wanted the people who followed them right <laughs> to endure it. So I think to the extent that we I mean, I navigated it, you navigated it, a lot of the people in this room navigated it. So we navigated it, but do you know what I mean? Like to disrupt it, I don't know. And, and I think your institution, my institution, we talk a good game about doing things differently. But I think, you know, I, I, you gave some pretty powerful numbers about the differences in the likelihood of attending a Harvard or a Stanford as a function of where your accident of birth. We haven't even talked about being lucky enough to be born in the US because we're 4% of the global population and there's another 96% out there. That's a whole nother thing, but we're t you know, here within the US. But I think it is, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's it, do, you, do you have an easy button to push? Not an easy button, but I have, a, <laughs> but here's where we might start. And it's not a message that necessarily wins plaudits in my precincts or <laughs> yours in Cambridge or in Palo Let's, Alto. Yeah, but like do you get, want to hear it anyhow? Sure. I like to get into trouble. We're getting, <laughs> I think broadly as a society, but also within higher education, we should rethink the steep hierarchy of prestige that distinguishes higher education, never mind the Ivy Leagues and Stanford, from other forms of learning, including those forms of learning on which most of our fellow citizens depend. A Brookings economist, Isabel Sawhill, did a calculation some, not too long ago about the amount the federal government spends helping students go to higher education, $164 billion a year. And that's a good thing. I'm in favor of supporting that, uh, people being able to go to university. And the amount the federal government spends on technical and vocational uh, training institutions compared to 164 billion a year, 1.1 billion a year. Right. That's a vast disproportion. And it's not only a fiscal problem, it reflects the valuation and the social esteem associated with community colleges, technical and vocational training. Now, it might seem utopian, given where we sit, even to reconsider this. But it's not all that utopian. There are many other countries, including advanced industrial democracies, that don't organize their education this way. Germany is one example. In Germany, there's not a desperate, competitive, 
rat race that begins in some places here in, in preschool to get into this or that university. German universities don't have that kind of steep pecking order. And there is greater investment in vocational and technical training. And there's also greater social esteem and honor for people who pursue those. So I don't think it's a distant utopian ideal. I think we can look to the experience in other uh, countries to possibly uh, seek correctives to the, to the imbalance that we've been discussing. Yeah. I have a million more questions, but I'm going to ask you one more, and then I'm yeah. going to open it up for a question from the audience. But it is interesting, for those of you, I, I think you may have missed this earlier, because we were talking about Germany earlier. And it turns out that right about now, it could be today, it could have been last month or next month, California's economy <laughs> is passing Germany's as the fourth biggest in the world. It gets a little bit to this equity efficiency yeah. stuff that we're talking about. California has been just an explosive success of economic policy. Apple, Google, yeah. right? And all, yeah. all this uh, in, in recent years. Um, but it is, it is challenging. So I guess my, I've, I have many other questions, if, um, but I'm curious, are you optimistic? <laughs> I, I would distinguish between optimism and hope. Okay. I'm not optimistic because there is too, too many institutions and forces in our economy and society have too big a stake in the way things are. But there is some basis for hope. I think there's a growing awareness that this is no way to hold our society together. Now, this awareness, it's hard to describe this as a source of hope because this awareness comes from the desperately polarized, angry, rancorous politics that has become so divisive that democracy itself is in question. But I think, and this is a ground for cautious hope, that as more and more people realize that the future of democracy is at stake, that we, we will begin to reconsider the economic arrangements that gave rise to the toxic politics that now threatens democracy and seek ways, of, seek some alternatives. Right, okay, with that, let me open it up for questions from the audience. Let's ask in the back, right here, right here, her, yeah. Hi, thank you for your talk. Jess Bartholo, and I have a question, two questions. One question is, when I speak about wage or income or earnings from people, I, I try to say, you know, that the person who made the coffee, the barista, they actually earned everything that the entire Starbucks industry, their investors, their board, their elite class, that they get, right? The person who made the coffee earns everything up the chain. But we often talk about the wages somebody earned rather than the wages somebody took home as a portion of the income they earned for the entire industry itself. So I wanted you to just kind of dig into how we talk about what people earn and the value of that. And then the second thing is more just a question yeah. on the topic of taxes. We had this great, wonderful um, exploration of a child tax credit. It reduced child poverty by 38%. Yeah. It went to every family with low income, the children, regardless of their work. And there's a, a big conversation about whether or not we should be giving tax credits, whether it's guaranteed income or what California has is a deep child tax credit of $1,000 down to the $0. And in doing so, and in, in supporting care, right and, right, and care work that's unpaid, are we somehow undermining the value of work? If you could speak to that, thanks. Well, it's, well both are really important questions, Jess. Thank you for them. I don't think that measures such as the ones you described, including child tax credit, undermine work. If we understand work broadly to include 
the work people do, whether or not it's ca that work is captured by and rewarded by the labor market. You mentioned that much care work doesn't even show up in the labor market. And it's enormously important work. It's not only unpaid, but it's also unrecognized and insufficiently honored. And this is why I think that when we talk about the economy of work and of reward, we have to expand our conception of work to all contributions to the economy and the common good, whether or not they are paid. But more than that, we have to pay attention to the moral economy of social esteem above and beyond questions of pay. So child credit, credits of the kind that you described, can be ways of, of doing that. Now, that's different from honoring care work is different from the proposals that come from certain quarters, including from some places in Silicon Valley, for a universal basic income as a way of paving the way, of soothing the way to an anticipated world without work, where robots will come for the jobs of a great many people. That version, or that inspiration for a universal basic income is antithetical to the dignity of work, because it concedes a certain project of unleashing robots, uh, calling it progress or efficiency, even if it means putting a great many people out of work and essentially paying them off. So I think it, there's a subtle distinction between strengthening the safety net, honoring the dignity of work, especially care work, on the one hand, and versions of a universal basic income that would try to mollify large swaths of the working population into accepting a world without work where they would simply be bought off. Uh, because what that can't replace is the social recognition and esteem and sense of contribution that comes from, should come from work whether it's well paid or not. Thank you for that question. OK, can we get another question? How about back here at the, at the macro? Hi, uh, Sat uh, Satyam Khanna with Seeper. Uh, I'm curious if you think there is a connection between the economic arrangements you just spoke of and our collective difficulty in solving global climate change. Yes, in a word. And is that it? <laughs> well, uh, here's why. We sometimes uh, speak, and elites often speak. This connects, Mark, with what you were saying about the healthcare debate. Yeah. And we saw it also during COVID, the lack of uh, the, the fact that what Dr. Fauci was saying became a political lightning rod and source of political con, uh, contention and division and partisanship. The mistrust of experts. You remember in the Brexit debate, one of the proponents of Brexit was presented with an economic report uh, that Britain would, uh, Britain's economic growth would be diminished according to experts if Brexit were enacted. And he said, this country has had quite enough of experts. So there is a deep mistrust of experts. We saw it during COVID. It, it came about, I think, in large part because economic experts assured us that a, a kind of hyper-globalized hyper economy with unfettered capital flows across borders and outsourcing of jobs to low-wage countries would make everybody better off. The gains to the gainers could be used to offset the loss to the losers and so on. But it didn't happen. 
and some gained and a great many people lost. So experts were discredited. And when it comes to climate change, we already see this. Many proponents of action to deal with climate change say, well, follow the science. And we heard that during COVID, follow the science. But while science can inform political choices, it can't replace political deliberation. That's the hubris of expertise, to pretend that it can. And what's interesting in the climate change debate is there is a, a big partisan divide in even the factual question whether the climate change that we're witnessing is caused by human action. And Democrats say yes, and Republicans uh, in greater numbers uh, than Democrats say no. Now you would think if it were a matter of factual knowledge that that partisan divide would narrow with more education. But it actually increases the, the, the more education the respondents, the greater the partisan divide. And even when you look, when, when they test for scientific literacy, those with greater scientific literacy, there's a greater partisan division than those with less. So what's at work here is not a lack, as many elites would think, it's just that they don't understand the facts. If only we could teach them the facts, then we could come to agreement on climate change. It's a political problem. It's not a problem about facts. It's a problem of trust. And the, the mistrust that's been generated uh, and the suspicion of, of experts who have just said follow the science has been generated precisely by the four decades experience that, that we've been discussing. Right, okay, so we've got time for one more question and I've got more than one. So, uh, well, that, my, my research assistant, Victoria, is raising her head. So anyway, I've got Victoria wins. I'm sorry, everybody. So anyway. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Hi, I'm Victoria. I'm an undergrad here at Stanford. Very much agree with a lot of what you said about credentialism and elites. And it reminded me of a conversation I had the other day with a PhD student here who told me to talk to people outside of Stanford, because everyone here is an academic. But more importantly, after that, I realized that everyone here at Stanford is either an elite already or on their way to becoming an elite. And a lot of, a lot of what you spoke about today was about a disconnect between the elites and the non-elites and a condescension from the elites, and how in part that can be remedied by, on the side of the non-elites, refinding or rediscovering this dignity and work. But also on the side of where the condescension is coming from, what incentive is there for elites to look outside of the ivory tower. In particular, what incentive is there for a lot of undergrads that I see at Stanford, Harvard too, other elite universities to not be sorted by the elite university into careers like finance, consulting, and tech? How can we incentivize elites to perhaps bridge this disconnect from their side? other than simply out of the goodness of their hearts. Right. What incentive can we cultivate? Yeah, wow, thank great. You. Victoria, thank you for that. Well, here's, here's one way to start, maybe. We need more class mixing institutions within civil society. We need, because part of, one of the most corrosive effects of the inequality of income and wealth that we've seen in the last four decades is the loss of public places and common spaces of shared democratic citizenship. I mean places that bring people together in the ordinary course of their lives. Those who increasingly over the past four decades, those who are affluent and those who are of modest means live separate lives. We live and work 
and shop and play in different places. We send our children to different schools. There are fewer and fewer class mixing places from public parks, municipal facilities, public swimming pools, public libraries, cultural centers, public transportation that bring, well, sports stadia for that matter. When I was a kid, I grew up in the Midwest before I was in California debating Ronald Reagan. That'll have to await the reception. In the Midwest, I was a baseball fan, and I loved to go to see the Minnesota Twins play when I was a kid. And in those days, there were differences between the box seats, they cost more, and the seats in the bleachers, the cheaper seats. But the difference, the best seat was about $4, and the bleacher seat was maybe a dollar. And gradually over the, so going even to a sporting event was a class mixing experience. CEOs and mailroom clerks sat side by side. And everybody had to eat the same soggy hot dogs and drink the same stale beer. And when it rained, everyone got You weren't away. drinking beer, were you? I wasn't. wasn't. <laughs> I heard about it. <laughs> But then gradually, in the 90s and 2000s, most sports stadia, not only in professional sports, the NFL and Major League Baseball and the NBA, they, they had corporate sky boxes, VIP boxes, where the privileged could watch from air-conditioned comfort above the motley fans in the stands below. And it was no longer true that everyone had to eat the same soggy hot dogs. And it was no longer true that when it rained, everyone got wet. And this wouldn't matter so much if it just happened in sports arenas. But what happened was, you know, I call it the, the skyboxification of American life. And essentially, the affluent vacated, seceded from public spaces. And some would say that there was a time when um, universal military service, for men at least back then, was a class mixing experience. We don't have that now. I don't think we should bring back compulsory military service. But we could have a debate about whether universal national service could serve a class mixing function. The basic point is this. Democracy does not require perfect equality. But it does require that people from different backgrounds, different walks of life, encounter one another, bump up against one another in the course of our everyday lives. Because this is how we learn to negotiate and to abide our differences. And this is how we come to care for the common good. Which is another example, and your question, Victoria, is, is a good way of knitting this discussion together. It's another example of how economics and the civic infrastructure of democratic life and questions of commonality, whether we really do identify ourselves as citizens sharing in a common project, these things come together, which is why I think the best kind of economics acknowledges its necessary connection to some of the big moral and civic questions, Mark, that we've been discussing here today. OK. Well, with that, please join me in thanking Professor Sandow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.